Welcome back, everybody, to the Tennessee Titans franchise here on Madden 23. Today, the Titans are headed to Arrowhead Field for some Sunday night football against the Kansas City Chiefs, who once again look like a legit contender for the Super Bowl. The Titans are out for blood. This Kansas City team beat Tennessee twice last year. In the regular season, the Chiefs beat the Titans by about 40. Then we go into the playoffs in the divisional round and what ended up being a really exciting game, but the Kansas City Chiefs had a game-winning touchdown to propel themselves to the AFC Championship, which they eventually lost to the Bengals. Our Titans might be the hottest team in the league. We've won six games in a row, coming off a big win in the last episode against the Raiders with fellow rookie quarterback Justin Tucker, who played well, but not as well as our guy, Romeo Colochi. Both Colochi and Tucker have had fantastic rookie seasons. They're neck and neck, basically, for the Rookie of the Year. Colochi did pass him after the win, however, putting him in first place. We also have a prospect profile today. We're going to go over the offensive and defensive linemen in this year's draft class, and we'll start with that before we get to the Chiefs game. I think our offensive line has been quite good this year when healthy. That's kind of been the problem. It seems like there's always one guy who's injured, as shown by the fact that we've only had two guys play the entire year on the offensive line, and one of them, James Daniels, got injured last week and will miss multiple games. When healthy, everybody other than Nick petit Ferrier has been really good. I think Evan Smith is the big one. He's only allowed one sack. The run game has been good as well. As for the defensive line, keep in mind we run a 3-4, so sometimes our outside linebackers will line up as defensive ends based on the package that we're running. I think the defensive line's been pretty good. We're surprisingly tied for fourth in sacks, which feels crazy because I feel like the defensive line's been pretty pedestrian this season, but the fact that we're in the top five in sacks is pretty impressive. Overall, we've got a lot of guys who can make plays. Our front unit, albeit inconsistent, has been better than it was last year. So we'll start with the offensive linemen in this class, and specifically the offensive tackles, and I think it's a really good group. I would not be surprised to see the Titans invest in an offensive tackle early in this draft. Even though Evan Smith is really turning into a good player, you need somebody else alongside him. At left tackle, we've got Dejarius Roberson out of Georgia, who if the season ended today, would be the number one pick in this year's draft. That's how good he is. Six foot six with a 6'11 wingspan, 370 pounds. He checks off all the boxes at the offensive tackle position. He's big, he's strong, he's pretty good in the run game, but what teams are really going to like about him is his ability in pass protection. He's a four-year starter with the Bulldogs and has improved in pass pro pretty much every single season of his career. He was a top recruit in his class, and he has absolutely panned out into a star on the Georgia offensive line, and I think there is a legitimate shot, depending on who has the number one pick, that he is the top choice in this year's draft. He is legitimately that good. While Roberson's been a top prospect for a few years, Ohio State left tackle Ron Chavius Anderson has gone past a very different path. Anderson originally attended Ohio State as a preferred walk-on. He eventually became the starter last year as a junior, and since then he's been the best offensive lineman in college football. He's been really solid in the run game, and as a pass protector, he has been elite. He has allowed just one sack since becoming the starter last year, making Puma Whitlock's life very easy under center. Anderson may not be the athlete that Roberson is, but his production, his character, and his work ethic are off the charts. His stock has skyrocketed this year, and right now he looks like he could be a top 15 pick. There are other good left tackles in this class, headlined by Dakari Bonds out of Miami, and plenty of other intriguing players down the board. I think this class is stronger at right tackle, though, which is pretty rare, but that is the case this year. You've got three surefire first-rounders and two other guys who could end up in round one. The main attraction here, pun intended, is Julian Maine out of Illinois, who's been a top prospect over the last two seasons, and he has lived up to the hype, and he has really taken some leaps and bounds this year as a senior to likely cement him as a top 10 pick come this upcoming April. I don't think he's the prospect that Dejarius Roberson is, but he's not far behind. Really impressive athlete, probably even better than Roberson. He's a good run blocker. He's a little bit inconsistent in pass pro, but he's really improving there. He's got good size, six foot five, 313 pounds, pretty long arms. I think he's going to be a good top 10 pick when it's all said and done, probably closer to the back end of the top 10. But if he ends up being a starter for a decade, you are not complaining. And I think there's a good chance that ends up being his career path. Then you've got this next tier of guys with Oswald Wigger. Jake Trotter, and then the fringe first-rounders, you've got Jalen Prater and Stone Utai. 
of this group. I think Jake Trotter from USC intrigues me the most, and that's because of his impressive physical profile. Six foot eight, 315 pounds. He's got height, he's got length, and he's got power. The thing with Jake Trotter is while he's a good pass protector, he's a great run blocker. This is somebody who embodies being an offensive lineman. He is somebody who's going to get on your face and enjoys flattening people onto the ground. He's the type of player who's really got that dog in him, and that's what you look for on the offensive line. Players who embrace that role. Players who embrace being the bullies up front, and that is exactly what Trotter has. He's got an a-hole mentality going after defensive linemen. That's what you look for on the offensive line. There's some good depth here as well, in my opinion. Very strong group at right tackle. As we look at guard, it's a pretty talented group, particularly at right guard, with multiple potential first-rounders in this group. We will start at the left guard spot. I don't think anybody's going to be drafted super highly there, but there are three talented players with Vasily Goujois, Carson Treason, and Luke Mergman. I think Treason from the University of Georgia is the most talented of the group. He's one of the most purely gifted offensive linemen in this draft class. As a pass protector, he is phenomenal. Four-year starter with the Bulldogs, and he's only allowed three sacks in his career. The problem is he lacks that dog in him. As we talked about with Jake Trotter, the tackle out of USC, he has that a-hole mentality of wanting to be a bully up front. I don't see enough of that with Carson Treason, which is why he's only being projected as a day-two pick. I need to see more toughness and physicality in the run game, especially at the guard position. However, with pure talent, he is really, really impressive. And if he goes to a system where he can tap in, he can end up being really good. At right guard, we're looking at multiple potential first-rounders. We've had some really good guard prospects in this series with guys like Magnus Zimmerman on the Bears now, Ryder Pratt, who was drafted by the Eagles last year. I think Xavier Riedel from Georgia is the next in line. Riedel's a really, really good guard prospect. And yes, it's easy to say that you know he plays for Georgia, who has four projected top 100 picks on the offensive line. But I think Riedel is really, really good in his own right. This is an impressive athlete, very good in pass protection, very solid in run as well. And with his solid frame, 6'2", 320 pounds, good arm length, I think you could try to switch him out to tackle to start. But if that doesn't work out, you're going to get a 10-plus year starter at guard. And again, in the late first round, probably right around Tennessee's range, if that's what you're getting, you are not going to complain. There are some other guards who could go in the first round right behind him. This includes Woody Bunham out of Michigan. He's been a four-year starter. He was an All-American as a freshman, and he has continued to be really good since then with the Wolverines. He's one of the big reasons why Michigan currently has the number one scoring offense in all of college football up to this point. He might be the most athletic offensive lineman in the draft. These guys do not move the way Woody Bunham does. He's a really good pass protector, decent in the run game. I wish he improved a little bit there, but with his agility and his quickness off the line, I think that's going to really up his ceiling at the next level. And I think you could be looking at somebody who could end up being a really, really good pro if he can tap in to his athletic potential, which I think there's a good chance he will. I do think he ends up in the first round. Again, another guy who could be right in Tennessee's range. Then you've got Abraham Kennedy out of Ohio State. This is a big, big kid. Six foot eight, 380 pounds. He is large and he sure plays like it. He is bigger than everybody on the opposing defensive line. And when you get to the NFL, it's easier to say that, yeah, these guys are bigger and more athletic than the college players, but they're not six foot nine, 380 pounds. Abraham Kennedy is still going to have the size edge on these NFL defensive linemen. So he's going to be able to win the same way that he does against these college defensive linemen. And I think that'll make the transition process pretty easy for him as he moves to the next level. Again, a guy who could definitely be in the Titans range. And even behind them, guys like Tavares Booker and J.R. Jumaji, really, really good players in the second or third round at right guard. Then we take a look at center. Not as deep, but you've got some good players at the top with Iami Zacchaeus and Caleb Kerfine leading the way. Zacchaeus is the name we'll look at here. He is head and shoulders the best center prospect in this draft coming out of Georgia. He is the fourth Georgia offensive lineman we have talked about today. All of these Georgia offensive linemen are going to end up going in the top 100, which makes it even more the mystery as to why Georgia is 2-5 and five on this season. Nonetheless, it's not because of the guys up front, and it's not because of the Yami Zacchaeus, who was recruited to Georgia as a six foot two, 280-pound lineman. Since then, he has grown two inches, and he's gained nearly 70 pounds. 
his workout regimen at Georgia has been really impressive, and his body transformation has been second to none. He hasn't really lost much foot speed, however, despite the fact that he's gained nearly 70 pounds of weight. Let's now move over to the defensive side of the ball, looking at the defensive linemen in this year's draft class. Even though the Titans are currently fourth in sacks, I would not be surprised to see them invest an early pick into a pass rusher. You can never have too many guys going after the quarterback. And it's a pretty talented group up front. We'll start with the top projected defensive lineman in this draft class, and that's Alabama's Okori Chibuke, who is currently the number two projected pick in the entire draft after Dejarius Roberson. Right now, he's the best defensive prospect in the draft, in my opinion. He's coming off a game against Arizona where he had 10 tackles for loss. Yes, you heard me right, 10, along with three sacks. This is somebody who can take over the game. He is a well-rounded athlete, 6'3", 263. He's got good speed, good quickness. He checks all the boxes there. And he's not a one-dimensional pass rusher. He wins with power. He wins with finesse. He's really good in the run game. I think this is somebody who just checks off all the boxes. Maybe he's not necessarily a freak athlete. Maybe he's not somebody who has elite bend and has all the pass rush moves. But he's got everything you look for with a defensive lineman and I think because of that he is going to be very good as a rookie and I think this is going to be a player who plays at a Pro Bowl level again for upwards of a decade and I think that is absolutely worth a selection here in the top five of this draft. Then on the flip side we look at Akin Fenwa from Georgia who's kind of the polar opposite. He is a freak athlete. This is somebody who is the number one recruit in his class. He's been a four-year starter at Georgia. He just really has not been able to tap in. If you look at these highlights, yeah, he's making plays, but he's not finishing off of tackles. He's missing assignments, but the athleticism might be too good to pass up. He doesn't necessarily have the greatest quickness, but he's fast. He's got elite bend, and I do think he is pretty solid right off the bat in the run game. I think his success will largely depend on where he gets drafted. If he goes to a team who knows how to develop defensive linemen, look at like the Steelers or the Ravens, somebody like that. I think this kid could end up being a superstar at the next level. The ceiling is really high, but the floor is also really low. There's some interesting players down the board. Thomas Fairbanks from Purdue. I like him a lot. Tooney Adelaide out of UNLV has had a breakout season as well. Moving over to right end, there are more intriguing potential first-rounders, including Frederick Swango out of LSU. This is a dominant run defender who's been very solid as a pass rusher as well. Another guy who really checks off all the boxes, and I'm confident he's going to be a good player in the NFL. He's got pretty good athleticism. His quickness is very impressive, and he's got a good array of pass rush moves along with his dominant presence in the run game. He's got good size at 6'5", 261 pounds. I just don't really have many concerns with this kid. He's a high floor player, probably going to go in the middle of the first round. Assuming the Titans are picking in the 20s or hopefully 30s, I don't think he's going to make it to their pick, but he could always be a trade-up candidate if he starts to slip a little bit. I think he's got flexibility to play on the edge and inside. Then we look at Aziz Shakira out of East Carolina, another guy who has risen up the boards at a mediocre pace. This is a guy who was not on anybody's radar prior to the season. He was a rotational end. For East Carolina over the first few years of his career, he's got an opportunity to start this year, and he's been one of the best pass rushers in the country. With his athletic profile, there's a lot to like with him going into the next level. Six foot five, 250 pounds. He's got ridiculous quickness and size along with his speed. He's got a good toolbox of pass rushing moves, and the production this year as a full-time starter has been off the charts. Obviously, it's a small sample size, but with his athleticism, I think teams are going to like him enough to consider him in the first round of this year's draft class. In, say, the Titans 3-4 scheme, he'd be more of an outside linebacker, but I think he's got the scheme versatility to play with his hand in the dirt or as a linebacker, depending on where he goes. Cedric Cabral, Glenn Carbine, and Case and Darwin are all pretty solid players shortly after them. But as we go down the board... There are some names who really intrigue me. Kervin's Armstrong, Bear Baseman, but I really like Jojo Adiamoa out of TCU. This is a guy who we've talked about throughout his college career in the NCAA Next Up series. In Jojo's sophomore season, TCU won the national championship, and that was because of their defense. If you remember, TCU had 10 starters on that defense who were seniors. The only non-senior was Jojo Adiamoa, who was one of the best players on that unit. Over the last two seasons, he hasn't been as good but he's still been solid. 
I want to see more consistency from him as a pass rusher and as a run stopper, but as we saw with the flashes that he showed as a sophomore and has shown over the last two years, he could be a good player. He's got good size, six foot four, 260 pounds. He's pretty athletic, and I feel like he should go higher than he's currently being projected, which is likely as a fifth or sixth round pick. I think he will get drafted, but it seems like it'll be in the middle of day three, which feels way too late for him. I think he could be a total steal for whoever ends up picking him. Let's move over to defensive tackle now. We've got a couple potential first rounders with Johnny Machado and Reese Pritchett, but I want to look at Lorenzo Nujulis because I think he's the best fit for Tennessee's defense. He is as slow as a rock. He doesn't really have a lot of lateral mobility, but he's the perfect guy who you can just plop in as the nose tackle and really produce there. This is a run stuffer who's not going to stuff the stat sheet. Unfortunately for him, he has missed most of this season with injury. Last year was really his only full season. And again, the numbers aren't going to wow you, but they're pretty solid. I think compared to other nose tackles across the country, he has shown more potential as a pass rusher. And this is somebody who has shown the ability to stay on the field on third down, which is a big deal. This is somebody who specializes in the run game, but is really improving as a pass rusher. And if he can hit his ceiling going after the quarterback, he could be pretty good. His lack of athleticism and quickness is not ideal, but other than that, I really like him. There's some depth as well at defensive tackle too, and overall some really fun players so I think we're definitely going to look at come the start of the draft. Let's now move our attention here to this pivotal Week 13 matchup on Sunday Night Football at Arrowhead against the Kansas City Chiefs. Currently our Titans are the number one seed in the AFC, but let's not get carried away. It's not by a lot. Even though we have tied for the best record in the league and the highest winning streak, we're only ahead of the Jaguars in our division by half a game. And if you look at the AFC, it is super competitive. The eighth seed, which is currently the Chargers, are only a game behind us at seven and four. So we do not have a lot of margin for error within this playoff race. Just because we're the one seed does not mean we have an easy road to getting into the playoffs, especially because we have a really hard schedule to end the year. We know this Chiefs team is really good. They're coming off an interdivision loss last week, so I think they're going to be extra hungry. They're coming back home. It's primetime football. They're playing against a team they know is a playoff caliber team, and we know on paper this team is loaded. Everything starts and ends with quarterback Patrick Mahomes. In case you've been living under a rock for the last decade, this guy is pretty damn good. He is the best quarterback in football right now. He's having another MVP caliber season, leading the Chiefs to currently first place in the AFC West. As of now, he is currently in third for MVP behind Clyde Williamson and Lamar Jackson. But if he has a really good final third of the year, he could absolutely win it. The Chiefs are loaded on offense with skill position, guys. It's not just Mahomes who's doing everything. They've got Clyde Edwards-Alaire and Patrick Dauphrend in the backfield. And then at receiver, Justin Jefferson. Brandon Ayuk, Calvin Ridley, Kramer Gildeford, the rookie who has superstar X-Factor. Oh, and at tight end, they have one of the three best players to ever play the position in Travis Kelsey. Their offensive line is top five in the NFL, and defensively, they've got two X-Factors up front with Chris Jones and Marcus Bowling. They've got a bunch of other young players like Nick Bolton and Trent McDuffie scattered throughout the defense. I mean, this roster is loaded, and they just happen to have the best quarterback in the league, the most talented receiver in the league, and one of the three best tight ends ever. So yeah, the Kansas City Chiefs are really, really good. So we've got our hands full here, but again, we might be the hottest team in the NFL. We've won six games in a row. We've won every primetime game this year, and we're looking to get another one here on Sunday Night Football at the rowdy Arrowhead Stadium. We know this place can get loud. We were here in the playoffs last year, and it was loud. So the Titans will start with the ball. Derrick Henry looking to get things going quickly as he will get it to the 36-yard line for a quick gain of 16. Got to set the tone on the ground and got to let Romeo cook. He'll go short for Bryant on third and four. He only gets two. So that brings an interesting scenario after the tackle there by the rookie safety out of Georgia, Gabriel Fanatelli. The Titans will go for it here on fourth down, and it is a pass. Romeo has a wide open man. It's Hot Rod Pryor with a block from Piggins. And Pryor makes it all the way to the two. A gain of 41 yards. The Titans were really not going for the big play there. They just wanted to get the first down. But shoot, that works too. Second and goal now from the two. Kolochi hands it off up the middle for Derrick Henry. And he is in for an easy touchdown. The King has entered his castle. The Titans march down the field here in the first four minutes of the game. And they lead 7-0. 
Here's the Kansas City Chiefs offense led by, of course, Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes on first down is nearly intercepted by Simpson. That was the first pass of the game, and he nearly turned it over. Kansas City does appear to be moving the ball down the field pretty well, though, as they have it at the 36. They've got one of their other tight ends in motion, as this could be a pitch to the left side for Clyde Edwards-Alaire, who gets by Awuzie and is lit up by Kevin Byard, but not before bringing it to the 49. Second and two now from the 43 for KC. We'll see what Mahomes has up in store here, as it's a fake handoff for Dauphren. Mahomes' pass is dropped again by the defense. Chidobe Awuzie had it right in his hands. There's a reason why these guys play defense and not wide receiver. Third and two, handoff for Clyde, and he does not get it. Jordan Ruffin and Harold Landry both bring him down, and the Chiefs would surprisingly punt it on fourth and one in their own territory. The Titans have it back. Multiple defensive linemen outrunning Romeo, or at least they're trying to, but that's not going to stop Romeo from getting to the 29-yard line for a gain of 12. Kolochi continuing to really impress as a scrambler this year as he goes downfield. What a catch! by Quinn Crew, putting Trent McDuffie on a poster to the 46. I know it's early, but the Titans look really good on both sides of the ball tonight. Kolochi goes short for Derrick Henry. He will end up losing around five. Not as good of a play there. Nice tackle for loss from Kansas City. Second and 14 now, about 30 seconds left in the quarter. Kolochi under pressure, and he is sacked on the play by Marcus Bowling, one of the two X-Factors on the defensive line. The bowling ball coming in to make the play, and it is now a third and long. Romeo Colochi looks to throw it. He's going to go downfield for Scotty Pickens, who makes the catch just shy of the first down marker. That'll wrap up quarter number one. The Titans look really good. They lead at 7-0, and they have a very interesting decision to start the second quarter. Do you go for it? Do you kick? Do you punt it? Tennessee's going to keep the offense out of the field. They will look to go for it to start the second quarter. It's a handoff here for Derrick Henry, and he will get the first down. He only gains two, but that's all he needs to keep the drive going. Now from the 34, the Titans with a new set of downs here looking to capitalize. Romeo Colochi under more pressure, and he is sacked again. Tyrone Smith, the rookie out of Arizona, leading the way to bring him down. Smith picked late in the first round of last year's draft. Third and 19, Kolochi looks downfield. It's nearly intercepted. He was just kind of heaving it up. He probably should have thrown it away. So after all that, the Titans are going to end up punting. <laughs> Who could have guessed? Jeffrey Walker, the second-year pro out of Houston, looking to get a good one. And that's a good one, all right. Down to the six by Chidobe Awuzie. What a punt from Jeffrey Walker. We'll see what the Chiefs can do now. Their offense has done virtually nothing so far today. Mahomes looks to throw it, going downfield, and he connects with Brendan Ayuk to the 44, pushed out of bounds by the former Kansas City Chief Juan Thornhill. If you remember in the playoff game, Thornhill got stiff-armed to the ground by the running back Patrick Dauphrend for the game-winning touchdown with seconds left on the clock. Justin Jefferson makes a nice play out to the 40. Patrick Mahomes has got to get the ball in Jefferson and Kelsey's hands because they're obviously great playmakers. He tries to get it to Kelsey, but instead it's intercepted. Kevin Byard with the interception, and the Titans force the turnover. Travis Kelsey was open, too. I don't know if he just missed the throw or if it slipped through Kelsey's hands, but it goes right over to Kevin Byard, who picks off his second pass of the year. That wasn't a perfect throw, but Kelsey absolutely could have caught that. So the Titans force the turnover. They'll get it back. Romeo takes a shot downfield, and it is caught by Scotty Pickens, who gets it to the 27. Romeo's had some very good throws in his NFL career. That one was one of his best. The way he just lobs it up with perfect touch for Scotty Pickens. That ball was like 30 yards beyond where Scotty was when he threw it. The thing with accuracy is you're not trying to throw it where the receiver is. You're trying to throw it where the receiver is going to be when he's going to catch it. Romeo Colochi knows that and launches a dot. Here's Derrick Henry on the very next play of the game. Brings it to around the 16-yard line. Good start here for Derrick Henry. Looking very good on the ground. Kolochi under a lot of pressure here on first down. He outruns the defender again. Looking to make it to the end zone. But he slides to the four. Romeo Kolochi is not human. Kyle Pitts is human. He's actually injured. And he might end up missing multiple weeks. A really big loss for this offense. Pitts has already missed multiple games this year with a prior injury. First and goal from the four. Play action. Kolochi connects with Chig Okonkwo for the score. And the Tennessee Titans will make it a two-score lead. It's now 14-0 about halfway through the second quarter. 
Really good play design there by the Titans, and now the Chiefs have a little sense of urgency. Their offense has been pretty abysmal today. It's about time they wake up. Nice first down there by Ayuk. Third and four, Patrick Mahomes looks to throw it. He's under pressure from Pierce. He's going to take a shot downfield, and it is broken up in the secondary by Awuzie and Thornhill. So that'll be another punt. The Chiefs still off the scoreboard. They would down it at the six, but no safety for you. Elijah Bryant with a nice run. He gains around 12. That'll bring us to the two-minute warning. It has been all Tennessee here in KC. They lead 14-0, trying to do some more damage as Quinn Crew makes a nice play wrapped up after a gain of 19 by McDuffie. Third and inches now. Romeo Colochi looks to throw it. There's a flag on the play. He is sacked. We'll have to see what the call on the field is, and they will call a holding against Tennessee. So do you make it a third and 10 or a fourth and seven? I think you decline it here, and that's exactly what the Chiefs are going to do. So Tennessee's going to trot on the field goal unit. It's a 56-yarder for Bullock with the wind against him. Bullock's range has really declined throughout this season. I'm surprised the Titans trust him here, but he makes it. So Bullock, Fat Randy, nails it from 56 yards out. And it is now a 17 to nothing game. The Chiefs have it back. 30 seconds left in the half. Mahomes under pressure, and he will be sacked by Devontae Turner Jr. and friends. It looks like the Chiefs are going to get nothing here in this first half, and they will be left with a goose egg on the scoreboard. What a dominant start here for the Tennessee Titans. They lead this game 17 to nothing. I am so impressed on both sides of the ball by this team. We'll see if they can keep it going in the second half. We'll start with our halftime report around the rest of the league, and we will start in Lambeau, the old-fashioned rivalry here with the Bears and the Packers. And it was a very one-sided game today. It was all about the Packers. Genesis Moon and the former Titan, McCole Hardman, would connect for a long touchdown here, leading the Packers to a 35-7 win. Green Bay is now 9-4. They are in a tight battle with Detroit in the NFC North to try to win that division. The Bears are kind of in it, but this loss certainly is a big hit. We've got another big rivalry here. The Bengals facing off against the Baltimore Ravens, two of the better teams in the AFC. Both of these teams competing for that division. And it would be Joe Mixon and the Bengals who would end up taking this one by the final score of 28-20. to The defending champions are now 9-3 and on the season. The Ravens could have tied it within the division, but now the Bengals are up by two games. The Monday night game is a pretty good one. We've got the Bills headed down to Carolina to face off against the Panthers. And here are all the other scores around the league. Unfortunately, the Jaguars won this week, and a lot of the other really good teams in the AFC won also. So if we lose, then we are going to fall behind a little bit. The good thing is we are, don't look like we're going to lose. We're up 17 to nothing. We're going to focus on running the ball in the second half because we're up pretty big. And since the Chiefs are down by a lot, they're probably not going to run the ball. They're going to focus on the passing game, so we've got to stop the pass. Clyde Edwards-Alaire fumbles the ball within a minute of the second half, and it's picked up by Trey Hendrickson. Things just cannot get better for the Kansas City Chiefs. This game has gone from bad to ugly to really ugly for Kansas City. Now, we got to see if that ball was actually out. I don't know. As we look at the replay right here, look at the left elbow. Down, forcing the ball out by contact. They will review and most likely reverse this play. Unfortunately, I think it is the right call. Could have been a big turnover for the Titans, but instead a massive break for the Kansas City Chiefs, who will hold on to possession of the football. The Chiefs got an answer here off of their lucky break, off of a near turnover. Second and 11 here from the 43 for the Chiefs. Mahomes will drop back to throw it. It's a screen for Edwards Alaire, and it's nearly intercepted again. Gonzalez got a hand on it. Third and long now for Kansas City. Mahomes looks to throw it once more under pressure. Goes downfield, and it's broken up. Nice play by Bayard. It looked like Mahomes was trying to get it to Ayuk, and that'll bring out the punt team once again for the Kansas City Chiefs. Here is the kick from Tommy Townsend. The All-Pro goes all the way to the 5, and it's going to be returned by Rocket Reddick. Reddick with a really nice return, gets it past the 20, and he is hit late. That's an automatic 15. Personal foul against the Kansas City Chiefs who get called for the late hit. The Chiefs cannot be making these types of mistakes. It's on Antonio Marlander, the young linebacker out of Southern Mississippi. With Kansas City trailing by three scores, you cannot afford to make boneheaded plays like that. The Titans looking to take advantage of their field position as Scotty Pickens gets a solid gain to the 31-yard line. Romeo Colochi has missed some throws today. He's only 14 of 24, but for the most part, he's having himself another fantastic day. Colochi keeps it on the option and is smothered in the backfield, losing around three. He'll be wrapped up on the play by one of the defensive linemen, and it is now a third and six. 
Pelosi looks to throw it. He's going to go short for Elijah Bryant, who hauls it in to the three. The Titans with another opportunity here to get the touchdown. I was on first and goal. It's going to be a short pass. And Muhammad McBride, the tight end of Oklahoma, is in for the score. McBride was acquired at the trade deadline from Detroit, and he's going to be asked to step up with Kyle Pitts' injury. So the Titans extend their lead. They are now up 24 to nothing. This is an all-out blowout. Total dominance, just like last year when these two teams played in the regular season. But it's the other team who's doing the dominating. Kansas City has it back, second and two. Mahomes goes somewhat downfield, and it is caught by the gambling man, Calvin Ridley, who gets it past the 50. Following play here for the Chiefs. They finally got it past midfield for the first time in the second half, and immediately Mahomes gets sacked. R.J. Robinson and Asher Gonzalez bring him down. The talented two linebackers who both have really broken out this season for the Titans. Third and 11. Mahomes' pass is dropped again by the defense. It's Cardell Simpson, and that'll wrap up the third. Mahomes has had so many dropped interceptions today. He's lucky he's only turned it over once. Tennessee leads big, 24 to nothing, trying to finish this one off here in the fourth quarter. Third and five, Derrick Henry hauls it into the 47-yard line. Good throw by Romeo Colocci, who I don't think has thrown an incompletion here in the second half. Derrick Henry does not get the first down on third and short, so the Titans are going to go for it. Hand off for Elijah Bryant to the right side, and Bryant will get the first as he ends up gaining around eight. Elijah Bryant quietly has had himself one of his more productive days of the year as he gets it back on third and four. Bryant, with room, gets it to the 18. Good run there for the former Florida Gator. The Titans would eventually choose some more clock. There's only three and a half minutes to go as they would tackle on three, making it 27 to nothing. The Titans just chewed at six and a half minutes of clock. That's how you do it. So Kansas City has it back now. They're in real danger of getting shut out. As on second down, Mahomes goes up the middle for Brennan Ayuk. He will get it to around the 40. Second and 10 now. Mahomes looks to throw it. Looking for the sideline, and it's picked off by Farley, but he was out of bounds. Another near turnover for the Titans. It feels like they had like five opportunities to turn the ball over today. On third down, Travis Kelsey left wide open, and he will bring it all the way to the 30 before being tackled by Bayard. Third and three, Mahomes has another dropped interception. Good Lord, if the Titans were not up by so much, this would be a pretty big issue. Fourth and three, obviously, the Chiefs have to go for it with sub two minutes. Mahomes looks downfield, and it is caught by Brandon Ayuk for the touchdown. I was really hoping Tennessee would be able to get the shutout, but unfortunately, it's not meant to be. The Titans would end up recovering the following onside kick. It's Traylon Burks who recovers it, and that should be able to give an easy passageway to end the game here for the Titans. 27-7. What a dominant win here for Tennessee on both sides of the ball. In order to make a statement in this league, you got to beat good teams. And the loudest statements are made when you beat good teams on the road. We went on the road and dominated the Kansas City Chiefs in one of the most hostile home field environments in the National Football League. And to add a cherry on top, we did it on primetime. The whole world got to witness that this Tennessee Titans team is for real. The Titans have now won seven in a row. We're 9-3 and three on the season. We're still the number one seed in the AFC, and we just beat a dominant team on their home turf. That's how it's done, baby. Really good stuff here on both sides of the ball. Romeo Colocci was not perfect in the first half. He was basically perfect in the second half. He didn't miss many throws. Mahomes, on the other hand, did not look like himself. We ran the ball well, better than they did. Our receivers stood out. Scotty Piggins making more plays. The offensive line was solid. I thought our front unit was really good. I think we only had two sacks today, but we set a lot of pressure. We made Mahomes' life hell. Kevin Byard, obviously, the interception, and we also had multiple dropped interceptions as well. Now, the one bad thing about this game is we have three new injuries, all the key starters. Kyle Pitts broke his foot. He's going to miss three games. Carlisle Kaplan fractured his arm. He'll miss two. Chidovia Wuzier dislocated his hip. He'll miss three. So that's three pretty important starters who are going to miss most of the rest of the regular season. Here's a look at the scores. We saw most of them other than the Monday night game, which the Bills ended up beating Carolina 35-20. to Players of the week, Najee Harris, Josh Allen, Jeremy Fenelon, and Joey Bosa. So that'll bring us to the next episode here. We've got a doubleheader with the Texans and the Colts. We've got a really hard schedule to end the year. I know these two games seem kind of easy. The Texans are bad. The Colts are mid. But this is not an easy stretch. These are interdivision games, and being within the division neutralizes things. And they're both on the road as well. Our final three games are against the Bengals, Chargers, and Jaguars, who are all playoff caliber teams in the AFC. So we've got a really hard schedule to end the season as we look to win our division for a third straight year and hopefully get ourselves the number one seed in the conference. 
That'll wrap up today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed a really fun win here on the road in Kansas City. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.